Amy's father was a man who came in one day to the restaurant where Jeanette had waited tables since she turned 16, a diner that everybody called the box because it looked like one, like a big chrome shoe box sitting off the county road, backed by fields of corn and beans, nothing else around for miles except a self-serve car wash, the kind where you had to put coins into the machine and do all the work yourself. The man, whose name was Bill Reynolds, sold combines and harvesters, big things like that, and he was a sweet talker who told Jeanette as she poured his coffee and then later again and again how pretty she was, said it in a way that sounded like he meant it, not the way boys in school had, as if the words were just something that needed to get said along the way to her letting them do as they liked. He had a big car, a new Pontiac, with a dashboard that glowed like a spaceship and leather seats creamy as butter. She could have loved that man, she thought, really and truly loved him, but he stayed in town only a few days and then went on his way. When she told her father what had happened, he said he wanted to go looking for the man, make him live up to his responsibilities. But what Jeanette knew and didn't say was that Bill Reynolds was married, a married man. He had a family in Lincoln all the way clean over in Nebraska. He'd even showed her the pictures in his wallet of his two kids, little boys in baseball uniforms, Bobby and Billy. So no matter how many times her father asked who the man was that had done this to her, Jeanette didn't say. She didn't even tell him the man's name. And the truth was, she didn't mind any of it, not really. Not the being pregnant, which was easy right until the end, nor the delivery itself, which was bad but fast, nor especially having a baby, her little Amy. To tell Jeanette he decided to forgive her, her father had done up her brother's old bedroom as a nursery, carried down the old crib from the attic, the one Jeanette herself had slept in years ago. He'd gone with Jeanette in the last months before Amy came to the Walmart to pick out some things she'd need, like pajamas on a little plastic tub and a wind-up mobile to hang over the crib. From the start, Jeanette always thought of the baby as her, because in her heart she wanted a girl, but she knew that wasn't the sort of thing you should say to anyone, not even to yourself. She'd had a scan at the hospital over in Cedar Falls and asked the woman, a lady in a flowered smock who was running a little plastic paddle over Jeanette's stomach, if she could tell which it was. But the woman laughed, looking at the pictures on the TV of Jeanette's baby sleeping away inside her, and said, Hun, this baby's shy. Sometimes you can tell and others you can't, and this is one of those times. The baby came in summer, the girl she wanted and named Amy Harper Belafonte. There seemed no point in using the name Reynolds, the last name of a man Jeanette guessed she'd never see again, and now that Amy was here, no longer wanted to. And Belafonte, you couldn't do better than a name like that. It meant beautiful fountain, and that's what Amy was. Jeanette fed and rocked and changed her, and when Amy cried in the middle of the night because she was wet or hungry or didn't like the dark, Jeanette stumbled down the hall to her room, no matter what the hour was or how tired she felt from working at the box, to pick her up and tell her she was there. She would always be there. You cry and I'll come running. That's a deal between us, you and me, forever and ever, my little Amy Harper Belafonte. And she would hold and rock her until dawn began to pale the window shades and she could hear birds singing in the branches of the trees outside. Then Amy was three and Jeanette was alone. Her father had died, a heart attack, they said, or else a stroke. It wasn't the kind of thing anyone needed to check. Whatever it was, it hit him early one winter morning as he was walking to his truck to drive to work at the elevator, and he had just enough time to put down his coffee on the fender before he fell over and died, never spilling a drop. Jeanette still had her job at the box, but the money wasn't enough now. Not for Amy or any of it, and her brother in the Navy somewhere didn't answer her letters. God invented Iowa, he always said, so people could leave it and never come back. She wondered what she would do. Then one day a man came into the diner. It was Bill Reynolds. He was different somehow, and the change was no good. The Bill Reynolds she remembered, and she had to admit she still thought of him from time to time, there was something about him, a kind of warm light from inside that you wanted to be near. It reminded Jeanette of those little plastic sticks that you snapped so the liquid inside them made, and so the liquid inside made them glow. This was the same man, 
but the glow was gone. He looked older, thinner. She saw he hadn't shaved or combed his hair, and he wasn't wearing a pressed polo like he had before, but just an ordinary work shirt like the ones her father had worn, untucked and stained under the arm. He looked like he'd spent all night out in the weather or in a car somewhere. He caught her eye at the door, and she followed him to a booth in back. What are you doing here? I left her, he said. And as he looked at where she stood, she smelled bare as and as he looked at where she stood, she smelled bare on his breath and sweat and dirty clothes. I've gone and done it, Jeanette. I've left my wife. I'm a free man. You drove all this way to tell me that? I thought about you, he said. He cleared his throat. A lot. I've thought about us. What us? There ain't no us. You can't come in here like you're doing and say you've been thinking about us. He sat up straight. Well, I'm doing it, he said. I'm doing it right now. It's busy in here. Can't you see that? I can't be talking to you like this. You have to order something. Fine, he answered, but he didn't look at the menu on the wall, just kept his eyes on her. I'll have a cheeseburger, a cheeseburger and a Coke. As Jeanette wrote down the order and the words swam in her vision, she realized she had started to cry. She felt like she hadn't slept in a month, a year. The weight of exhaustion was held up only by the thinnest sliver of her will. There was a time when she wanted to do something with her life, cut hair maybe, get her certificate, open a little shop, move to a real city like Chicago or Des Moines, rent an apartment, have friends. For some reason, she'd always held in her mind a picture of herself sitting in a restaurant, a coffee shop, but nice. It was fall and cold outside, and she was alone at a small table by the window, reading a book. On her table was a steaming mug of tea. She would look up to the window to see the people on the city of the street she was in, hustling to and fro in their heavy coats and hats, and see her own face there, too, reflected in the window, hovering over the image of all the people outside. But as she stood there, these ideas seemed like they belonged to a different person entirely. Now there was Amy, sick half the time with a cold or a stomach thing she'd gotten at the ratty daycare where she spent the days while Jeanette was working at the box, and her father dead, just like that, so fast it was like he'd fallen through a trap door on the surface of the earth, and Bill Reynolds sitting at the table like he'd stepped out for a second, not three years. Why are you doing this to me, she said. He touched the top of her hand. Meet me later, he said. Please. He ended up living in the house with her and Amy. She couldn't say if she had invited him to do this or if it had just somehow happened. Either way, she was instantly sorry. This Bill Reynolds, who was he really? He'd left his wife and boys, Bobby and Billy in their baseball suits, all of it behind in Nebraska. The Pontiac was gone, and he had no job either. That had ended too. The economy, the way it was, he explained, nobody was buying a goddamn thing. He said he had a plan, but the only plan that she could see seemed to be him sitting, sitting in the house doing nothing for Amy or even cleaning up the breakfast dishes while she worked all day at the box. He hit her the first time after he'd been living there three months. He was drunk, and once he did it, he burst out crying and said over and over how sorry he was. He was on his knees, blubbering like she'd done something to him. She had to understand, he was saying, how hard it all was all the changes in his life. It was more than a man than any man could take. He loved her. He was sorry. Nothing like that would happen again, ever. He swore it, not to her and not to Amy. And in the end, Jeanette heard herself saying that she was sorry, too.